Welcome to the Damcasters, brought to you in association with the Pima Air and Space Museum. I'm your host, Matt Bone. The Convair B-58 Hustler is one of those aircraft that has gone down in legend as folly, maybe, or perhaps even one of those great missteps in aviation design. But today we're going to be looking at the aircraft a little bit more critically. And joining us is Colonel George Holt Jr., U.S. Air Force retired, who spent his career on the B-58 as well as the B-47 and other aircraft, but who critically was in the Pentagon when the decision was made to get rid of the two B-58 wings. And George was writing up the counter-argument to that plan. His book, which is called The B-58 Blunder, How America Threw Away Its Best Strategic Bomber, is a very interesting read, and it takes a myth-busting approach to a lot of the things we take as fact, and basically everything that's on the Wikipedia page. So we're going to have a look at some of those myths and talk about George's career and his time on The Hustler. But we're going to start off by finding out how George ended up in the U.S. Air Force. I grew up in a, a fairly poor neighborhood uh, in uh, Fairhaven, Massachusetts, and uh, we, we had a strong work ethic in my family. Uh, there were five of us in the family, and we were all expected to leave school when we turned uh, 16 and uh, get out and get a job and help support the family. At, when I turned uh, 16, I made a deal with my parents. I said I'd like to finish high school, and uh, I'll work full-time at the same time. And in my senior year of high school, I was working full-time in a textile mill. You know, I went in at 10 a. Uh, 10 p.m. at night, got out at 6 a.m. in the morning, and then went to high school. And uh, by the end of the week, I was falling asleep in class, but I finally hardly made it through. <laughs> uh, from the high school, uh, I, I actually joined as an enlisted man in the Air Force, and I spent three years as an enlisted airman. Then I went to aviation cadets and got my navigator wings in commission. And uh, that's how it started out. And and I retired after 32 years in the military. And it was quite a career because you ended up in quite a few places, didn't you, in the Pentagon and things. But what we're going to be talking about today is your time on The Hustler, which is a very interesting and, I guess, very misunderstood aircraft, isn't it? Uh, yeah, it is It is misunderstood. Uh, and, and I think primarily because there were only two wings of B-58s and, you know, multiple wings of B-47s and B-52s. Uh, mm -hmm. So there's not too much known about uh, the actual operational experience of the B-58s. So I guess for those that don't know it, I suppose we should really introduce the Convair B-58 Hustler. What what was it? What was the original intention for the aircraft? Well, the, they wanted a supersonic uh, bomber, Mark II+. Plus. And uh, the original design specification was to have a four-engine delta wing uh, bomber, uh, three crew members, uh, one pilot, and uh, two navigators. And uh, for performance-wise, it had four J-79 engines. And uh, in afterburner, you had a total of 60,000 pounds of thrust. What, what a lot of people don't realize that the empty weight of a B-58 was only 55,000 pounds. So theoretically, you could go straight up in that aircraft in full afterburner. It had uh, a 20 millimeter uh, Gatling gun uh, in the rear. Uh, the third navigator on the airplane, he was the, the defensive systems operator and he controlled that Gatling gun and he also controlled the uh, electronic devices uh, to confuse the enemy. Uh, my role is a... Uh, Navigator Bombardier was to, of course, uh, navigate to the targets and, and release bombs on, on the targets. So were you sort of doing, the, as is as two navigators on board the aircraft, how do you split that workload for you know, making sure the pilot doesn't get lost? It's sort of unusual. Norm normally you would have uh, at least two pilots uh, on an airplane. Uh, uh, you know, the B-52 has two pilots. They have... Uh, Two navigators, uh, a radar navigator and a, and a bombardier navigator. And then you have uh, mm -hmm. other people, you know, they, they had a gunner at one time on the, uh, the B-52. But uh, we did it with, uh, with only three crew members. We sat in tandem. Pilot was up front. I was in the middle and the defensive system operator was in the rear. 
because it's a very sleek looking aircraft. I finally got to see one when I was out at Pima and it's very science fiction-y when you see it for the first time because it's sort of very long and thin with those four engines in the, the pods under the wing. What was your first impression when you walked up to them and they said, that's your ship, sir? Well, it was pretty much uh, the, the way you felt when you saw it, Matt. Uh, when, I, when I first <laughs> saw it, I, it was much larger than I thought it would be. And uh, the impression I got, you know, walking out to the airplane uh, – well, I, I felt I felt sort of strange on my first mission, uh, and what I realized was I didn't have the parachute strapped to my back, you know, that I used to have going into B-47s. Of course, in the B-58, uh, we didn't have parachutes. We we sat in what was called an escape capsule, and these escape capsules uh, had its own parachute device uh, strapped to it. So if we had to bail out, we bailed out in an escape capsule. I saw one of those as well when I was at Pima. And there's sort of a clamshell sort of thing that snaps around the seat. They look terribly scary. What what was it like strapping in knowing that those were there? I suppose it would keep you safe at a Mach 2 injection, but they're quite different from a normal ejection seat, aren't they? Uh, yeah, quite quite different. Uh, well. When you raise the handles on the uh, ejection capsule, what happened, uh, there was a bar underneath your knees that brought your your knees up into your chest, and there was another bar on your ankles that pulled your ankles in tight. And then when you squeeze the triggers, that clamshell door would slam shut. And then right after that, uh, you would have a rocket-assisted takeoff uh, in the capsule. And then you stayed in that capsule uh, until you uh, uh, went down to the ground. It was actually, uh, you could actually land in water in that capsule, and it was floatable. It was uh, quite an ingenious thing. Sure. But uh, the thing I liked about the B-58, uh, after spending six years in the B-47, uh, I never felt comfortable in the B-47 because we had down, the navigator had a downward ejection seat. And uh, during takeoff and landing, that was that was very critical. If we had to eject in the B-47, you know, good luck with that being so close to the ground. So uh, that was nice in the B-58. All all ejections were up rather than down. Which is always a useful direction to punch out of an aircraft, in I thought. I was uh, I was right on the edge of uh, being able to fit in that uh, escape capsule at at six foot one. I don't think. Uh, Anyone over that height could have uh, fit in the capsule. So I, I just from a sort of layman's perspective, really, that transition from the B-47, which to outside views is, is quite a conventional looking aircraft, that sort of moved to a smaller crew, the three seats in tandem in a big Delta as opposed to a big swept wing aircraft. What what was the the training like to, to move across? Because I guess you're still doing the navigator bombardier role, but how does that change from the Boeing aircraft to the Convair one? In the uh, in the B-47 aircraft, uh, we, we almost had to be uh, a maintenance uh, person as well as a, uh, a navigator uh, bombardier. Uh, th- there was always something going wrong with the, uh, with the radar system and the bombing system, and we had these... Uh, uh, line replaceable units that we could actually uh, swap out while we were in the air. Uh, the B-58 w- wasn't like that at all. You know, it, uh, everything was uh, internal. Uh, you know, we, we, we didn't have to do any in-flight maintenance on the uh, the B-58. Uh, the thing I liked about the B-58 was uh, it, it was very quiet. Even, even though it had all of that thrust in the engines, it, it was very quiet when it was flying. Uh, people used to ask me, you know, what it was like to go through the speed of sound. And uh, surprisingly, uh, you never knew you were going through the speed of sound unless you were looking at your instruments. Uh, Once you hit Mach 1, the altimeter would drop about 500 feet and then slowly come back up as you went through uh, uh, the speed of sound. Uh, uh, you You never realized that loud crashing uh, explosive sound that people on the ground would hear, you know, when a, when an airplane went through the speed of sound. So that there was no turbulence or sort of jolt? It was just a knock on the instruments was the only thing that you'd see? No, no, uh, just, just what uh, went right through it. 
and uh, you would never know it while you were in the airplane. Which was always what they said about Concord, was the hard part of the design was to make sure nobody spilled their drink when it went through the sound barrier. Right. And Convair had done it 10 years before. Wow, that's fantastic. What type of ops were you flying in the Hustler? Because she is a strategic bomber, wasn't she? So she, you were on the same alerts as the rest of SAC. What mission profile would you be training for? Would it be the same as, say, the B-52s and B-47s, or would you be operating differently? Probably similar. Uh, one thing about the B-58, uh, we, we would take off uh, not fully loaded. Uh, you know, the airplane, when it was uh, with no fuel, only weighed about 55,000 pounds, and the total thrust was uh, about 60,000 pounds. Uh, when we took off, we, uh, we went and refueled, and we brought on a lot more fuel than we could have had on board when we took off. Uh, typical mission, mm -hmm. uh, we'd fly a high altitude uh, navigation leg, do some high altitude bomb runs. Uh, I can't say bomb drops because we never dropped drums. We were we were uh, scored mm -hmm. by these uh, uh, Nike radar sites. They, they would electronically score where a bomb would have hit. We always had to get within 2,000 feet of the target. Uh, low altitude bomb runs, I think that's where we excelled compared to the B-47 and the B-52. Uh, we went in uh, low level, uh, and it would be about maybe 30 to of 40 minutes of low altitude navigation uh, right on the deck and uh, just below the speed of sound, about uh, 0.91 Mach number. And uh, as we came, came in and uh, ran these bomb runs on the uh, these Nike sites, uh, very often uh, they could not pick us up. They they could not tell us where we were uh, looking at the, uh, the ground clutter because we were, you know, pretty much right on treetop level. So quite, quite often those Nike operators would ask us to pop up so they could acquire us on radar. And, uh, you know, we would do that, then go back down on the ground and, and come on in. That was a low-level low level mission. Uh, and B-52s, B B-47s pretty much did the same thing. They tried to uh, emulate the, the wartime mission as much as possible. The thing I liked about the B-58, uh, because the navigation and bombing system was so accurate, I flew a lot of times uh, in what was called radar silent. I would actually uh, put the radar in standby so it wasn't emitting uh, any radiation at all. And uh, I would have a dial that I could look at and see where the crosses would be uh, if, it, if they were supposed to be on a, uh, a checkpoint where I could update my latitude or longitude. And uh, when I came close enough, I would turn the radar to on from standby. And uh, sure enough, those crosshairs would be sitting pretty close to where that radar checkpoint would be. So it was just a, a slight adjustment, if there was any adjustment at all. And then I would turn the radar back off. We had, uh, we had Doppler radar in the back of the aircraft, but the Doppler radar gave us ground speed and wind drift. But the Doppler radar was a very pencil Pencil thin radiation straight below the aircraft, so that really couldn't be picked up by enemy radars. Because I guess the profile would have been to get quite deep into the Soviet Union, so you'd be wanting to stay as dark and as low as you could for as long as possible. So just those few moments of verifying your position was all you needed, and it kept you safe. Yeah, I, I, I never, I never had any problem with the B fifty eight as far as the uh, the navigation and bombing system went. Uh, it, now, it, always, it, it was not always like that. When the B-58 first came out back in the, the early 1960s, there was a lot of vacuum tube uh, technology, especially in the bomb nav system. And uh, a lot of times it would overheat and you would lose your, uh, you would lose your radar, and you would lose your bomb, bomb nav system altogether. But in the uh, 67 time frame, uh, the bomb nav system went, went through a complete overhaul and transition from vacuum tubes to transistors. And it was, uh, gosh, nearly 99 to 100% reliable after that. So let, let's get into some of those myths. Oh, actually, before we do that, because you, you were working in the Pentagon when the decisions were being made as to whether or not to continue with the Hustler. What was that process like? Because in, in your book, you describe it as very much the Air Force men who were XB-52 were very much 
pushing for their aircraft over anything else. Is that an accurate way of simplifying it, or was it a lot more political than that? It, it was a lot more political. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember I, uh, I, I was in the Pentagon, and I was, uh, I was the B-58 expert in the Pentagon at the time, and I remember getting a call from uh, uh, a pilot I used to fly with in the B-47s. Uh, um, he was uh, Colonel uh, Al Dugard. And uh, he gave me a call while I was in the Pentagon. He says, uh, he says, George, I want to give you a, a heads up. There's a director of plans from uh, Strategic Air Command that's coming out uh, to the uh, Pentagon, and they, and they want to brief the chief of staff of the Air Force on uh, getting rid of the two B-58 wings. Uh, they they want to try to keep uh, at least six older model B-52 wings and exchange they're willing to give up the B-58s. And I said to Al, I says, well, that's crazy. I thought they had decided to, to keep the, the B-58 in service at least through uh, most of the 1970s. Well, anyways, it's, I thought the director of plans of strategic air command would come to the plans directorate in the Pentagon, but no, he went to the operations directorate, which is down in the basement of the Pentagon. And uh, in three days, he was able to convince the chief of staff, General uh, Ryan at the time, to make that decision. And the, the decision was made. I tried to fight it. Uh, I, I worked uh, night and day uh, when I found out what found out what was going on. Uh, but uh, when I got all my stuff together, you know, I went through the air staff, got all concurrences and all that. And I went to my brigadier general that I worked for. And I said, you know, uh, this is why we should keep the B-58. I went to him that, that afternoon about 1 p.m. He says, uh, he says, George, uh, I understand uh, what you've got here. And, and it's a good decision. However, General Ryan this morning told the Secretary of Defense that he was willing to uh, give up the B-58s. So it was a done deal. That must have been so frustrating to know that that decision had been made a few hours before you were able to present your argument. Yeah. Well, one of the arguments that they that they used uh, in, in the briefing that the director of plans used was uh, uh, one of the claims that was made was that the B-58 was three times more expensive to operate than the B-52. And... Uh, but what was never mentioned was there was only two wings of B-58s, okay? And each B-58 wing had roughly 40 aircraft, okay? Mm -hmm. B-52 wings at the time only had 15 aircraft. So if you compare aircraft to aircraft, the B-58 actually came out less expensive uh, than the B-52s. So it was, a, it was a nebulous argument that they used, but... Uh, you know, not knowing uh, what those wings consisted of, you know, people would, would believe that. So they were just taking wing and applying a number to it without breaking down what that wing actually entailed. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, well the, the cost of operating uh, any aircraft, you have to include uh, not only the, uh, the, the maintenance and the operational costs, but also the uh, personnel costs and the support costs within each wing. All that has to be taken into consideration. So, uh, you know, we had uh, about one half the crew members and a, and a B-58 crew compared to a B-52 crew. Well, all of those costs have to be considered also. And, uh, but all, all in all, it, it turns out that the B-58 aircraft to aircraft wise was less costly to operate. And I point that out in my book. Yeah, which is the first of, we're going to look at four or five of the myths that you bring up. Because funnily enough, I've just Googled the B-58. And the first thing that comes up is it was substantially more expensive to operate than other bombers, which, I, again, is that argument that was made for it. And, and one that I've always taken is red. But as you said, it's not comparing apples with apples, is it? It's, there's much more nuance to that point. Absolutely. We're going to take a quick break so that we can get the latest from the Pima Air and Space Museum with Head of Collections, Andrew Bowley. Here we are at the Pima Air and Space Museum with one of our two uh, Sikorsky Dragonflies. The Dragonfly was one of the first helicopters to go into service with the U.S. military. 
the Air Force, the Marines, and the Navy use them. This one was used by the Coast Guard. Um, it was the first helicopter used by the Coast Guard. They were heavily used to kind of set up doctrine for search and rescue for the Coast Guard. So a lot of what went forward with more modern and powerful helicopters after this was all stuff that they learned using the Dragonfly. Um, this one did do a, a stint on one of the Coast Guard icebreakers because um, they usually had helicopter support with those. It's interesting to take a look at these earlier helicopters that used World War II style piston engines, like this one had a Pratt & Whitney R98. So it limited a lot of the payload these types of helicopters could take. So it really was until you started having turbine engines and helicopters, like starting with helicopters like the Huey, that helicopters were actually able to start carrying larger amounts of troops and carry more equipment and more crew, weapons, etc. But this is one of the ones that started it all, like with the Bell and some of the other early helicopter designs. To learn more about what is on display and what events are coming up at the Pima Air and Space Museum in Tucson, Arizona, please do check out their website at www.pimaair.org. And now, back to the show. Let's have a look at another area, which is that that switch down to low level severely reduced the aircraft's range and value to, to sack. We were discussing that a minute ago. It coped with that transition to low level quite well, didn't it? You were saying how even with flying with the radars off, it was still staying more or less where it should be. What was that argument that because it was now going at treetop level, it was not doing what it's supposed to? How did that come up? Well, what are the other reasons... Uh, they, they said they should get rid of the B-58, you know, it was originally designed to be a high-altitude Mark II bomber. And with the, uh, with the new uh, radars, you know, that the, uh, the enemy had at the time, uh, they could uh, pretty much shoot down a, a high-altitude airplane. But uh, when we went from high altitude to, altitude to low altitude, actually our, our capability uh, much improved compared to other aircraft. You know, I already mentioned when we were... Uh, at low level, it was hard to see us. We had a very low radar cross section. When I was, uh, you know, working at the Pentagon trying to fight against taking the uh, B fifty B fifty eight out of service, uh, I went to some of my uh, air staff people and I asked them to run some possible radar detection runs. And one of the uh, the person that was one of those runs, he says, "Well, it's like comparing a postage stamp to a barn door." As far as radar concerns, <laughs> and I says, well, uh, yeah, the B-52 would be the barn door and the B-58 would be the postage stamp. So we had a very low radar cross-section, uh, and we also traveled along at low altitude at a very higher airspeed, much, much higher than the, the B-52. So our, our chance of reaching the target uh, was much higher than a B-52. And I guess that comes into the opportunity for the opposition to be able to see you and shoot at you. If you're going so fast at low level with that low cross section, it's making you a very hard target to hit. Yeah, the, 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 other, the other thing about low level, we, we had a very solid wing, okay? Uh, and, mm -hmm. and it was a, a much shorter wing. Uh, the, the B-52 had a long, flexible wingspan. And if the B-52 encountered turbulence at low level, uh, there were certain oscillating forces because of that flexible wingspan that, that made it much harder to fly at low level. Turbulence at low level or B-52 was much, much greater. Uh, the B-58, because of its short, a very solid wingspan, uh, did not feel that much turbulence. Uh, many times we would have a B-52 go into a low level route and uh, we'd be waiting, you know, to go in after them. And uh, if they encountered any turbulence, they would abort the route and climb out from that uh, low-level route, saying a major turbulence, you know, they did not want to continue. Mm -hmm. We went in, and what we experienced in that same airspace uh, was light to moderate turbulence. So we didn't have to cancel our low-level routes. 
And this comes to your point that the arguments made that the low level row caused more fatigue on the, the Hustler than it ever did on the B-52. And I guess that's where, the as you're saying, the design of the two aircraft is out because to be very basic about it, the B-52 is quite spindly con- compared to the, the, the durability of the Hustler. In your book, you point out a number of um, incidents with B-52s attempting low-level runs where they did actually um, suffer fatigue failures. How much effort sort of went into rectifying the B-52 that could have been equally shared with some of the things like a train following radar and stuff that the B-58 was lacking? Uh, what the B-52 had, what the B-58 did not have, they had uh, what was called uh, uh, a terrain, terrain following uh, radar. You know, they could, uh, they could look ahead of the aircraft and, uh, with, with radar and uh, do what was called terrain avoidance. So uh, theoretically, they could go lower uh, than the B-58, uh, but the B-58, uh, because of its higher airspeed, and its lower radar cross section uh, was actually uh, less ca- less capable of being detected by uh, enemy radars. So the the trade off uh, favored uh, the B fifty eight in that respect. And I I suppose that's a bit of the math that has to be played into it. You don't have to go as low if you're harder to spot. Whereas something as big like the B fifty two would need to be hiding in more ground cluster than than the hustler would have to. No, yeah, it was much more detected by uh, by low altitude uh, radars. One of the other areas that you sort of talk about as well in the book is maintenance, and I am endlessly fascinated by the efforts that the maintainers go to to keep these aircraft in the air. They say, and I say they, that's the public, people like me on podcasts who don't know any better will read one line about how difficult an aircraft it was to maintain. Was that true? Or as your experience on the aircraft, was it able to be maintained better than some of its contemporaries? It it, it, did re- it required uh, a lot more uh, maintenance uh, uh, than the B- B-52. Not, not necessarily a lot more maintenance, but uh, the B-58 was hard to get at. Uh, it, it was <laughs> enclosed and uh, well, anytime you had a problem, you had to take off certain panels to get to the root of the problem. One of the biggest problems uh, with the B-58 to begin with, uh, I had mentioned earlier, was the bomb nav system when they, were, they had the uh, vacuum tubes rather than the transistors. Uh, there was a lot of downtime involved with, uh, with the airplane back in the early days. My brother, he was uh, Sergeant uh, John Warburton Holt, was actually an assistant crew chief on the B-58s. At the same time, I was flying at the B-58s at Bunker Hill Air Force Base, now Grissom Air Force Base. But, but he said uh, it, it was hard to maintain. But one thing uh, about the B-58 maintenance people, uh, even though it was different from maintaining uh, aircraft that they were used to, they got the job done. And for the entire life of the B-58, we always maintained our alert capability. About one third of the B-58s were always required to be on alert, ready to go to war with munitions loaded. And we never fell short on that. So, uh, yeah, it, 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 was, uh, it was a hard aircraft to maintain. But uh, the maintenance people, they said they wouldn't, they wouldn't trade places with anybody else in the world. They loved that airplane. Because when you see it, it's just shrink-wrapped, isn't it, to make it as slippery as possible to maintain that high speed um, when it's up at altitude. It, 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 is, it is a beautiful-looking thing, and I'm jealous you got to spend so much time with it. I only got a half hour walking around <laughs> in awe of it. I suppose the other, the other thing that comes up is that the aircraft was tricky to fly and had a high accident rate. I guess this also sort of points to the nature of the Delta Wing. It means you have to fly the aircraft in a slightly different way to a straight or a swept aircraft. But was its accident rate as bad as popular opinion has it to be? There's a certain thing about that accident rate. They said that uh, 
initially, uh, it was claimed that of all of the air, of, of all of the B-58s, 26 were destroyed for a 22% accident rate. Well, actually, if you look into it, seven of those aircraft out of the 26 were destroyed before the B-58 ever became operational. It was Convier air crews while the airplane was still in uh, test and evaluation before it was ever released to the Air Force where seven of those were destroyed. And each time one was destroyed, something was learned about the aircraft and, you know, and certain things would change in, in the design of whatever it had to be. If, if, if you look again at what caused some of those aircraft after the B-58 was uh, deployed, you can see the way the aircraft accident rate, while it was operational, which is the way you should measure it, uh, came down to around 15 to 17 percent rather than the 22 percent uh, that has been advertised. And that's a very important distinction to make because loss rates in operation are very different to loss rates during testing. You know, you, you think of some, especially some of the early, uh, what they call the Century Series of fighters, they were losing plenty of those during testing, but that was never applied to operational loss rates. Does this go back to that spin that was being put on by those in the Pentagon who wanted to save the B-52 wings, that they were trying to amalgamate as many numbers as they could to to put a less positive spin on the aircraft. Uh, uh, yeah, absolutely. You know, that, that they had to make a good case why uh, they tried to uncover everything bad about the B-58, even things that weren't that bad or actually false. You know, the idea that you could uh, you could have six B-52 wings for the cost of two B-58 wings, mm. which was true when you compared wings to wings, but it wasn't true comparing aircraft to aircraft, you know, because of the higher number of uh, B-58s in a wing. But uh, yeah, at, at the time, it was uh, strictly political. SAC Strategic Air Command at the time had many, many, many more B-52 wing commanders than uh, B-58 wing commanders, you know, uh, the B-58s only had two wing commanders, uh, so mm. people were trying to maintain their positions, I guess. And that's always key, isn't it, when it comes to looking at these things, is who's in position and, and who's up for promotion. Um, I suppose looking back at the aircraft slightly more critically with, with sort of your experience as well, when we look at the longevity of the B-52 and, of course, the, the B-1 now, if the effort had been put in to the Hustler that had, has been put into those other aircraft, even, even the B-2, which is still going, how long do you think the Hustler force could have stayed in service for, considering it had started service in the, the early 60s? I, I believe many, many more years than the phase-out, you know, that occurred in uh, 1970. Mm -hmm. I believe many more years. Of course, there was a, there's a structural uh, integrity, you know, with a with an airplane that uh, flew that fast. It always has to be taken into consideration. But uh, I, I believe if they had regular uh, modifications to the B-58, like they did with the B-52, that it it could be around for a much longer. We we have eight uh, surviving B-58s. Uh, none of them are flyable and uh, none of them could ever be flyable. You know, it's like the one at Peeber, you know, it's on static display. And uh, we have seven other others around the country, you know, that people can look at, but it'll never fly again because it would be uh, impossible to, to get it to fly again. But while it was operational, you know, and it had the, uh, the maintenance crews and everything else going with it, I think it could have stayed, stayed around for many, many more years. What should we take away when we look at the Hustler in context? Because it's a very different aircraft to the B-52. And, you know, people call the B-52 venerable because it's going to be around forever, apparently. But what should be the thing that we, we look at the, the Hustler more critically about, do you think, given the bad press that it's had for all these years? Well, it was a fantastic airplane, uh, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, one, one of the problems with... Uh, all of the uh, the bad press that the B-58 got. And uh, if, you go, if you go to Wikipedia, you know, look up the B-58, you, you'll find all of these 
fallacies about the B-58 uh, in Wikipedia. You know, that, that's the worst place you can go for facts about the B-58. But I, I think the true story is, is, is slowly getting out. Uh, when I wrote my book, uh, you know, the B-58 blunder, how we abandoned the, the best strategic bomber, it became a bestseller when it was first released. And it's since sold uh, 7,000 copies. The newest B-58 book is called the second edition. And uh, it has a lot more uh, facts in it, a lot more photos and so forth. So it, it, it's selling well. Royalties are, are coming in. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to find people buying it, you know, to learn more about the true story of the B-58. I thoroughly enjoyed it when I received my copy. And I think that's an important point that you make is to judge the aircraft on what it was as opposed to some of the political arguments around it. Because the arguments you make in it are very well done and based upon the facts and figures that, that you experienced and then you worked on in the Pentagon. And I suppose as we start to, to wrap up, when you look back on your operational years on the B-58, what's your proudest memory of serving on that aircraft? I guess it was a comfortable feeling, you know, being in the B-50. Mm -hmm. it, it, it was shirt, shirt sleeve uh, flying. You know, we, we didn't wear parachutes. People used to ask me, uh, when, did you get claustrophobic, you know, sitting in such a tight, air, tight space in the airplane? And my answer was always, I was too darn busy to even think about getting claustrophobic. <laughs> There was, there was so much to do, you know, so much going on. Uh, but my, my memories uh, are, are sort of on the, the humorous side. I remember one time uh, we, we, we had an airplane that had gone down to uh, Car Carswell Air Force Base. It, it had to have some retrofitting done. When we took off, we only had enough fuel to get back to Bunker Hill Air Force Base. So it was a very, very light airplane, hardly any fuel on board at all. And my pilot asked... Uh, ground control, you know, if he could do a, an afterburner takeoff and climb to altitude, and they gave him permission to do that. So we're sitting at the end of the runway, you know, with, with, with brakes on, and uh, I said, uh, okay, Al, uh, go ahead. Uh, when you release brakes, I'll press my stopwatch, and we'll time how long it's going to take to get up to 24,000 feet. That was the altitude that we were supposed to level off at. Uh, so he said, okay. It says, I'm, I'm releasing brakes now, and boy, I was thrown back in my seat. You know, he went to full afterburner, and we hit the S1 and S2 speed, and he started to climb. And we were pretty much going right straight up. Uh, at at 15,000 feet, he could see the end of the runway below him. <laughs> and uh, he called uh, ground control and says, I'm passing through 15,000 feet, and they wouldn't believe him. They, they said, sir, do you mean 1,500 feet? <laughs> he says, no, make that 19,000 feet now, and we're getting ready to level off. And uh, he says, okay, George, I'm leveling off now. What, what was our time? I looked at my stopwatch. It was 48 seconds from brake release to 24,000 feet. <laughs> we went up like a rocket. <laughs> and uh, I, I guess the other uh, amusing tale I was doing bomb runs over Chicago. Uh, there was a Chicago Nike that was scoring these uh, bomb runs for us. And uh, we encountered a, a pretty hellacious jet stream. It was well over 200 knots, one of the, the, fa the fastest jet streams I've ever, ever been in. And uh, going inbound to the target, it seemed like it was taking forever, you know, to get to the target. And when we turned around, gosh, we were going like a bad L hill down downstream. So finally, I said, after about the third run, I said, uh, I'll tell you what, Al, I'll give you an airspeed to fly that probably should give us zero ground speed. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> Al says, okay, okay, what do you want me to fly? And I gave him the indicated airspeed that he should be flying. And uh, we're on the bomb run. You know, we already called in. And uh, I'm reading my Doppler ground speed at the time. And I'm reading it, and I'm looking at it, and uh, I, I see we're down to about 60 knots now. And, uh, and I'm counting down 50 knots, 40 knots, 30. And I'm getting down to very close. And I said, Al, we got zero ground speed now. And all of a sudden, Nike, <laughs> uh, the Nike site called us up and, and said, Delta 30, do you have any problems up there? Do you have an emergency? Because what happened, the needle that they were tracking on their plotting board stopped and when that needle stopped <laughs> it meant 
it could mean only two things to Nike ground control. We either exploded in the air or crashed into the ground. So, so Al, you know, he's, he's still trying to maintain his, uh, his, his slow airspeed, you know, and he says, George, I don't know if I can maintain this uh, much, much longer because we're starting to lose altitude. I said, well, go ahead and tell uh, Nike that we'll, we'll continue on in. So he, he called uh, Nike and he said, uh, uh, this is a Delta 32. Uh, we stopped for a while to eat our flight lunch. We're inbound again now. <laughs> <laughs> there was dead silence for the Nike side. Good thing they didn't give me a, a bad bomb run just to make up for that. That was, uh, that was some of my memories, but it was a, it was a fantastic airplane. We, we could, we could fly fast, and I proved that we could also fly very slow. <laughs> George, this has been a lot of fun. And I have to say that, especially reading your book, it's made me be a lot more critical about some of the assumptions I've had. And it certainly, I think, needs to get out there that the B-58 was was not what she has been made out to be. So thank you very much for joining us. And Thanks for sharing some stories because it's it is such a lovely looking aircraft and to know that she was the business, as we would say here in England, is very reassuring as well. Well, thank you, Matt. I enjoyed talking to you. Uh, you have a wonderful day. I cannot thank Colonel Holt enough for joining us here on the Damcasters. And I think it was an interesting conversation, don't you? Let us know in the comments, feedback, all that good sort of thing, because when I walked up to the B-58 at the fabulous Pima Air and Space Museum in Tucson, Arizona, linked in the description below, what I was struck by was my preconception of the Hustler being this quite fragile aircraft that would prone to shake itself apart at low level wasn't it. Yes, it is streamlined and shrink-wrapped and very science fiction-y, like we were saying in the pod, but it looks robust. It's just quite chunky for something as slender as it is. And that may sound like a contradiction in terms, but I was very struck by it when I saw it for the first time. And I think it was the first aircraft I mentioned to Scott when he said, what stood out for you? Followed by the B-47. And reading George's book, I think there's an argument to be made there for reassessment. It is an aircraft that fell into that very specific time in U.S. Air Force doctrine, where speed was key. The B-70 was coming to take things even to Mach 3. Of course, our early episodes with Ken Cat about the B-1 and it being a sort of Mach 2 replacement aircraft for the B-58 make it all very interesting. So I would recommend going out and grabbing a copy of the B-58 Blunder, links in the description below, of course, and have a think about it for yourself. I think George makes a very good argument, and of course... It can go from standing still in the air to Mark 2 Plus. That's quite a thing. As always, thank you so much for your continued support. It is really humbling. And I'm loving the feedback that's coming back into the pod. We've got lots of fun things coming up. As always, if you can let your friends know, that's fantastic. Stick some stars into your podcast algorithm of choice. Like and subscribe on YouTube. The algorithms all help. And of course... Hello to our AI overlords who push this thing up and put the ads in and do all that good stuff, which helps keep it going. Of course, if you want to become a patron as well, you can become a damn castier for just three pounds a month plus the VAT over on Patreon. So do check that out. You get thank you cards, you get stickers and bookmarks and all that good stuff from me. And you get these episodes early, no ads, different intro and outro and a chance to ask questions as well if there's an upcoming topic that you want to ask questions about. But they're not alone because, as I said, the fabulous Pima Air and Space Museum in lovely Tucson, Arizona, are our sponsor. And please do check them out if you're ever out that way. Their website is fantastic as well, and it's just basically this incredible treasure trove of aviation history. We've got some fantastic things coming up. We're going to be looking at nuclear testing. We're going to be looking at the depiction of the pilot on screen. Discussion about masculinity there. And also Black and Caribbean pilots in the Second World War, which I'm really excited to talk to John about as well. So do take care of yourselves and we'll see you soon. Bye. The Damcasters is hosted and produced by Matt Bowe and is a Bony Abroad podcast production. To learn more about our podcast and check out our previous episodes, head to www.thedamcasterspod.com.